thank you very much for having me here. And I will talk about DevOps, thinking in systems and value streams. Quickly to myself, my name is Roman Ross and I work since 20 years for Zülke. I joined Zülke directly after university as a junior.NET engineer, became an expert software engineer, then an architect and then a consultant. One thing that was always at my heart was how can we continuously deliver value? How can we ensure the quality? And how can we automate things? So when the whole DevOps movement started, I jumped right on top of that and became one of the organizers of the DevOps Meetup Zurich, which is a monthly meetup in Zurich, which we are doing. You can always join, it's absolutely free and we have amazing talks. And I'm also one of the organizers of the DevOps Days Zurich together with Tobias. I'm organizing this amazing event in Zurich. It's a two day conference um, with around 300 people and you should really join, it's absolutely amazing. And because DevOps is really a hard topic of me. I also have my own YouTube channel with a lot of videos where I talk around DevOps and I also blog a lot and tweet a lot. Nowadays, uh, I work uh, with different clients in different industries and I'm doing leading the DevOps transformations. What do I see in these DevOps transformations? What I see is that the business and the clients, they have bright ideas. And they take these ideas and they put it into Word documents and Jira documents and they throw it all the wall of confusion to the development team. Development team takes these requirements and says, yeah, if you want to have that, I can implement that. And they throw it over the wall of confusion to the build pipeline and it goes straight to quality or to the testing. And they look at that and they say, well, it, this does not seem right like the requirements, but they test something, it's green, and it goes to operation and operation says, whoa, how can we operate that? It, it does not work, but somehow they manage to do it and it goes to the client and to the business and they say, what is that? That's not what we have ordered. The problem is these wall of confusions. Usually they are caused because of silos. It is an absolute misalignment that we have here. And what you already can see is this thing is a value stream and we have interrupts in this value stream. So where do these problems come from? In the past, we all did waterfall. We have plan, test, deploy and so on. And scope was fixed, budget was fixed and time was fixed. Um, this was a problem, so we all said, yeah, let's go to Agile, and now we do it incrementally. And yes, we are still doing projects incrementally. Of course, the scope is now not anymore fixed, and we work incrementally, but we are still working in projects. And what we should do is we should work in products because that's what our clients want, what the business wants. So what is the problem then with projects? When you look at the project, then the project usually focuses on the output. So maximizing the number of stuff delivered, maximizing features, user story, tasks, code, lines of code. Versus the product where we focus on the outcome. Here we want to understand the customer need. We want to solve the customer problem. We don't want to deliver features. We want to solve the real problem of the customer. We want to change his behavior. Uh, he, we want to have an adoption. So one way to help that, to achieve that, is to use DevOps. Because DevOps is a mindset, a culture, and a set of technical practices which provides us with communication, integration, and automation, and close collaboration. And you can already see it. It is all about that value stream where we are going through plan, code, build, test, deploy, release, operate, and monitor. It's all about that. With that, we can deliver products. So who is working in these value streams. The term DevOps is completely misleading. 
it's wrong. Because usually people think it's about development and operation, DevOps. Some people say, yeah, let's fix that term. It's DevSecOps, which is development, security and operation. And then there was some other group which says, yeah, but business is more important. So let's call it BIS DevOps, which is business, development and operation. But this excludes some of the people. What we need to have is sort of a term like DevSec, BITS, ARC, COMP, QA, OPS. Um, and I'm pretty sure I have forgotten someone. Um, we call, can also call it DevStarOps, or we can call it DevXOps, or we can just call it DevOps, because DevOps is about bringing all the people, all the process and technology together to continuously deliver value. This is what DevOps is. Now, why is that important for you? So, in the year 2000, there were some small companies with funny names like Netflix, Google, and so on. And they experimented with Agile and DevOps. Nowadays, they are dominating the market. At the moment, um, we see the same happening in hardware today. Tesla, SpaceX, they are experimenting with DevOps and also with Agile ways of working. And the whole thing gets accelerated massively. It will have a huge impact on us. Do you want to have an example? Here I have an example from Elon Musk. You can think about this person, whatever you want. But he tweeted on the 7th of October 2021 um, that he's going to release now autopilot to their cars, to the Teslas, 10.2, to 1,000 owners with a safety score of 1, 000, uh, 100 and 100. What does that say us? So we have cars with software on the road and is doing a software update. But only for a small group of people, which is a canary release. And he also can track the safety score in these cars. So he has a, a great monitoring. Okay, um, eight days later, he says, all good. Um, everything was fine. And we are going to release now 10.3 to a bigger uh, group of 9900 safety score. That again means that there is an intense monitoring on how the software works, feedback from the customer which was, uh, was delivered, and again a canary release. Then on the 24th of October he says, ooh, shit, we have a problem <laughs> with 10.3. Uh, we are going to do a rollback now to 10.2. Now let's pause a moment. These are cars in the road which are driving and he's doing a rollback. Many companies are not able with the normal software to do rollbacks and he's doing that with software in cars. So the rollback is in full progress and not even 24 hours later he says, oh, all good. We fixed the issue, we are going to release 10.3.1, which is a fix forward. And with that example, you can already see how companies like Tesla are working and doing DevOps. So when we look at DevOps, then we usually see this infinity symbol. And DevOps is all about the modern software development or how we build products. And when we look at that, then we need to have an agile backlog planning, agile um, release uh, um, requirements engineering. We need to have agile software engineering. Everything needs to be in version control. We need to have a continuous integration with build and test automation and integrated security. We need to have a test data management. We need to have synthetic test data. We need to have a staging environment, an environment which is as close to production as possible so that we can test there. And we need to have deployment automation. And to, uh, to distinguish between deployment and release, we need to have feature toggles. This enables us to do canary releases and also dark launches. And when we operate it, we want to find the problems before our customers do, so we need to have proactive detection. And when something happens, we need to do cross-team collaboration. To enable us to do that, we need a full-stack telemetry, which 
has a, an alerting system in it so that we know what's happening and we need to log out how our features are used so that we can again go into the planning where we see what kind of features we should continue or which one we should stop. So, but how do we get from projects to products? So first of all, we need to apply the whole system thinking. And for that, we have a great tool, which is the value stream mapping. Value stream mapping is very, very easy. It is getting all the people of this value stream, which we have, into a room and some post-its. We say, okay, what steps are needed from idea until it is in production? Here you can see feature definition, design, code, test. We say, who is responsible for that test, uh, for this uh, step? Product owner, architect, developer, tester. And with that, we get a clear picture about the value stream. Often when I do these, these workshops, people are saying, ah, oh, now I understand how our value stream works end to end. Usually people tend to have only a partial view of the whole value stream. Then we are going to measure it. We are going to look at lead time, process time, and percentage complete and accurate, where we are going to see where the bottlenecks are. The lead time is the time from process end to the process end of the next step. So it is the whole time this step needs. The process time is the time where we really do value adding work. For example, in test, the lead time is 300 and 36 hours and the process time, the value adding work where we are really testing is only eight hours. So we have a lot of waiting time in there. The percentage complete and accurate is a number which says us how, um, in how many percentage the other step can use this product which we are creating um, without any rework. Which means at code we have 60%, which means in 40% of the cases we need to go back. So also there, we can already see where some bottlenecks are. And with that, we have a clear picture of the whole value stream and we can identify the bottlenecks and remove these bottlenecks. Now this value stream is nothing else than a continuous delivery pipeline. And to understand the continuous delivery pipeline, we need to understand some terms. The first term, is CICD. Usually you hear that CICD, but what does CICD mean? Let's look at the CI part. This is continuous integration. What is continuous integration? Continuous integration is then when a developer, or many developers are writing code on their local machine and they are committing that to the source code repository. They there in the source code repository, their code needs to be reintegrated with the rest of the code. That's why we call it continuous integration. The continuous integration server will then build this code, code does the code analysis, static security analysis, unit testing, and perhaps some integration testing. The important part is that feedback is given to the developer as fast as possible, in minutes, not in hours or days. The output of continuous integration is a deployable artifact. And now we are coming to the CD part, which is continuous delivery. We take this deployable artifact and install it automatically into the staging environment, a production near environment, where we again are executing a set of tests, manual or automated. And again, we are giving feedback to the developer if everything is okay. That's continuous delivery. Now, when we do continuous deployment, then we do everything before, continuous integration, the continuous delivery with automated tests in the staging environment. And if everything is green, we are going to automatically deploy that to the production server and execute again a set of tests. So, and then we get feedback. You need to know that there are not many companies which are doing continuous deployment. Most of the companies are doing continuous integration and continuous delivery, which is absolutely okay. You don't need to do continuous deployment. 
When we now look at an example of such a pipeline, um, then it can look like this. You have different steps with the continuous integration, continuous delivery, or the continuous deployment. But it is not enough because in the beginning you have the whole ideation and in the end you have the feature toggles, which is the continuous exploration in the case of the ideation and the release on demand where you are going to enable the feature toggles. And this is just an example of a, a pipeline. You see a lot of tools. I heard that you are using Azure DevOps. So Azure DevOps is a platform. It has many of these things already in there and integrates quite well already. But it is a continuous delivery pipeline which automates your value stream. In this continuous delivery pipeline, we need to build in quality right from the beginning. So back to the projects uh, in the waterfall, we had that V model, which you can see there. Someone was writing tests, then someone was writing a story, and then someone or a developer was writing code. And if we were lucky, she or he was also um, creating a, a test for that code. Then someone else was uh, testing that story and someone else was testing that feature. Between writing the code and testing, uh, writing the feature and testing the feature, there can be easily three months, six months, a year. It is all about delayed feedback. What we want to do in the agile testing is shifting left. How do we do that? We do that by using behavior-driven development. This is writing acceptance uh, criteria in the given when then form so that we can use that as an executable specification. Also, the stories are written in that form, and when we are going to write the code, we are going to write it as um, uh, with TDD, with test-driven development. This is just a test-first approach. And by having the specification already in a given when then form, we can use that so that we have already our tests. And with that, we are writing the tests directly even before the code is there, and therefore we are shifting left and can ensure the quality. We also need to look at our, um, our testing pyramid. The traditional testing pyramid was all about finding bugs. We wanted to find all the bugs in there. So therefore we had a lot of end-to-end -end tests, usually completely manual, then some integration tests and only a few unit tests. In the agile world, we want to prevent bugs because we have always the customer in mind and we look at where are the risky parts, which things do need to run so that the customer is still satisfied. Therefore, we have a lot of unit tests, some integration tests and only a few end-to-end -end tests. So it's really a change in the pyramid because we want to prevent bugs. Now, again, when we look at our um, infinity symbol, then this means that we use behavior-driven development. We have a clear definition of ready when a user story or a feature is ready. We are using test-driven development, so just a test-first approach. We, of course, have unit testing, static code analysis, and we need to have a definition of done. When is a story done? When, when is the quality good enough? Test automation, test data management is also needed. And when we are going to deploy to production, we are doing production testing. We execute a set of tests in production so that we can ensure the quality. And of course, we need cross-team collaboration, product detection, and a continuous monitoring so that we can ensure the quality of our services. So when we now look at that, then of course we also need to look at operation. How are we going to operate? And this is something that I see quite often that we are building stuff, but we don't think about how is this going to work in production. So we need to architect for probability. And this means that you need to build it and you need to run it. And when it breaks, then you are going to fix it as a team. 
For that, you need to have a good monitoring system, which alerts you from con um, dangerous condition based on tolerance thresholds. This is very, very important. You also need to have a notification strategy, and you also need to practice uh, disaster recovery procedures. There is nothing and better than having a disaster recovery procedure written in a Word document and when disaster strikes, you first need to search for it and then you see that it's outdated. So you need to often do that also because it's, it's part of your software. And you can see that also in the big companies, disaster always strikes. You will always have sort of a disaster and you need to have that failure culture in, in, in place. Also the teams, they need to work across the value stream together, really together. It's not about ops has a problem, it's about working together and not just finger pointing. So everybody is responsible for a great product. And one thing that is very, very useful is the incident post-mortems. You will have incidents and having these post models enable you to continuously improve yourself so that you have less and less of these incidents in the future. Now, when we look at that, we, of course, when we are going to plan, we need to architect for operability. We need to think right from the beginning, how are we going to operate this new feature, this new product in production. We need to build in application telemetry. We need to have that in place so that we can measure everything. Of course, we need to have infrastructure as code. Everything should be in version control, not only the code, all the configuration, all of the requirements, all the architecture needs to be there so that we can always do a rollback and that we always see who has changed what and why. Of course, we need to have the continuous integration with the build automation, also test automation needs to be in place and it needs, needs to be well architect so that we can architect for probability. The staging environment needs to be there and of course also the feature toggles. Then the cross team collaboration is again very important when we operate that product and we need to have that full stack telemetry. And here it is very important to have it really full stack, which means it needs to be include also the infrastructure. There is nothing uh, more frustrating when you have a problem in your application and it's caused by the infrastructure. So you really need to have the view on the whole system so that you can measure everything. And you also need to measure the features so that you can support the business in making the right decisions. So when we summarize that, when we want to build great products, we first need to go away from projects to products. We need to focus on outcome and not on output, not on the number of features delivered, more on the problem that we have solved for the customer. We need to apply that whole system thinking. Everybody in the whole value stream needs to have a clear view on the value stream and on the steps which are needed so that we can continuously work on that value stream, optimize that value stream, remove all the bottlenecks in this value stream so that we can make sure that the time to market um, gets smaller and smaller and we are faster and giving the client more functionality which they would like to have. And the whole value stream is nothing else than a continuous delivery pipeline. We need to automate this continuous delivery pipeline and we need to build in quality right from the beginning. And of course, in an automated way. And over that, we also need to build it for operability. So we need to make sure that everything that we, can, uh, that we are building can also run in production. For that, we need to have a great monitoring system, a great alerting system, so that we can make sure that our product works well in production. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Romano. Um, are there any questions in the room or online? Okay. 
Thank you, Romana. Very great talk. Uh, I really like the reference about DevOps variants. Uh, always amuses me how many we invent. Um, I've been working on very large scale systems in an earlier life of mine. And something I noticed, uh, even with environment propagations, is that you get into like one of the big problems will be environment disparity. So I'd like to hear your thought on that and maybe on what if more of the testing would be shifted into productive environments, which is, I think, a practice some do as well. Yeah, uh, very good question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so when you look at the DevOps fundamentalists, they say you don't have any more environments. You only have production environment. So every change goes straight to production. This is sort of the end goal <laughs> where some companies are aiming for. In my opinion, you should have um, just one syst uh, system or environment before production, which is as close as possible to the production system. And there I see two variants of it. One is you have a complete system, which is called user acceptance test, or however you call it in, in your environment, but it needs to be as close to production as possible. The other way is to have blue-green deployments. So you have two production systems and you just switch between these production systems. I think these are a good approaches. But I must also say I like the approach quite much only having a production system um, and every change goes into the production system. Um, we had that also and uh, when you are working with such a system, um, you, you, you code completely different when you know that when you are now going to commit that, it goes straight to production. It has an impact on how you are coding, but I can also, um, I can also understand you are regulated here and <laughs> therefore there is quite a lot of risk with that. So perhaps it's more the mobile app <laughs> which can be developed like that. I have one last question for you, Romano. So I know you overlook or you, you have many clients you're working with and also like larger scale companies. What if you could think of one typical or, or problem that you see everywhere, what, what would that be? Is there something that sticks out from all the different challenges? Uh, yeah, uh, there, there is one thing in all of these uh, DevOps transformations. And I know you, some of you will not like me. Uh, it is the middle management um, <laughs> that usually don't want to have such transformations because um, you're going to break down uh, their silo and they also lose some of their power. So uh, the middle management stands really in the way of uh, doing that and also having these uh, value streams and removing these wall of confusions, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much again, Romano.